Um, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, which many of them I know around here, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm very honored, and I want to thank the Xi Xing um, Organic Foundation and also the Bureau for uh, Forestry for this uh, invitation and the honor for me to uh, give this uh, keynote address here. How to follow uh, Professor Lee, but I uh, will go uh, in some details in some areas, not everything. We'll make sure we don't duplicate too much uh, in my presentation, which uh, again, uh, told transforming uh, agriculture. And uh, if you permit, I'll walk around a little bit because I'm, I need to, to move. Because I'm also a farmer, so I like to walk around. So since here I cannot be on my farm. And the one thing actually I'm going to do when I go back, I'm going to check my grapes who have leaf hoppers See if the wine is sweeter when I have a lot of leaf hoppers than if I have fewer leaf hoppers. Maybe it can also benefit uh, from, from uh, your research here on tea for my wine, since I'm also a wine producer. So what uh, I'm going to talk about, so I will uh, discuss a bit about sustainable agriculture and food systems, because I think we need to embed agriculture and the production in the whole food system. And if we don't do that, I don't think we're going to make the transformation we need. And I think that's something which came out now in, in the past few years. So a little bit uh, about some of the problems and challenges. So I'll go fast over what has been said already, a bit slower where uh, something new uh, may come. And then sort of, can we overcome these challenges? So we heard about challenges. We heard about there is research done. We have a lot of results. But actually, it's not really happening. I mean, it's happening, but not at the rate we want it to happen. We don't have time. We are in a, in a period right now, you can see worldwide, we have extreme weather situation just next door for my farm, two miles away, everything is burned down. Thousand houses, huge amount of forest, a thousand hectares of forest has, have, have burned down. And why is it so hot and so dry? While in other places, people are, are drowning. So clearly, I think there's something there. And so it is an urgency in act doing something. And not just anything. I'll show a little bit more about what uh, we can do right now and where we need to actually apply the lever. This is important. You know, where are the leverage points to make things move? And so we have a policy framework. So in the background, the SDGs, I think we have, this is totally unique. We have now uh, um, a framework which is universally agreed. It may not be as good as we want. We could have probably done a whole lot more. But you know, we need to start somewhere. And we have now what we need to get started. So why don't we do it? And then in the end, so what can you do? Because in the end, it is individuals who will make the change. It's not somebody else. It's yourself being a citizen, uh, using your citizens' rights to demonstrate, to vote, you can do all this. So if we all don't do it, and wait somebody else to do it, we're going to be waiting until we are all dead. And I think so we don't have that time, OK? So uh, to me, it looks like we need to read to move, to move on. And uh, I had the honor to be the co-chair of this famous report, IAASTD, Agriculture at the Crossroad. And I know everybody has read it. Um, you all know about it. And actually, next year is the 10th anniversary of its publication. The report, Agriculture at the Crossroads, was published in January 2009. So hopefully, we'll uh, see what we can do at the 10th anniversary uh, to dig it up. Now, many other reports have been published since. So, you know, we can publish more reports. What are we doing with it? And who actually is supposed to read them and put them into practice? At least in the IASTD, we published a summary for decision makers. We thought that if we work hard and put these 2,000 pages into 10 pages, which we did, that the uh, decision makers would actually read them and do something. Well, big mistake. The only people who read this report very well were the NGOs, people like you in this room and in rooms around the world where we actually are from the civil society groups. These are the people who actually have been pushing and making the transformation happen, which we have so far. Not the government and not the FAO. FAO has published a lot of reports. They are good at reporting. Inside this organization, unfortunately, only very few people are committed. Very few. This has to change. Because if they don't change, it's very hard to change. And they have access to every government and actually can tell them, you know, that's what needs to be done. 
So again, I think we need to really understand also the, the, the politics around what's going on or if not going on. And so if we look at so what we asked at that time was not, not just a little bit changing things. We asked for a paradigm change and a fundamental transformation of agriculture toward agroecology. That word is in this report. You can find it all over the place. The first time, really, it was brought out uh, into the wide open. And uh, I think that was important. And because we wanted to address uh, this issue of multifunctionality, uh, which is very important, because we need to pull things together. We need to think in system and long term. This whole uh, uh, holistic approach, and we have some good examples that if you do a holistic approach, where do we go? We actually add many, many elements, very important. And I think that we have to reconstruct agriculture the way that it's done. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. Um, and not only agriculture, but as I said, we need to transform the whole food system. And so, you know, we sort of, if you start to look at what's wrong with that food system, there are many things. Um, malnutrition, we have a lot of hunger in the world. Not only hunger, we have malnutrition. We have undernutrition, we have overnutrition. And so that is actually part of also this food system and agriculture itself is actually quite a big problem, a big part of that problem. Not only, but it's very much in there. And so if we don't really address the, these issues of hunger, macro, macronutrient deficiencies, which leads to non one and obesity, and then also diabetes, this is uh, the uh, narrowing down of our diet. If you go into landscapes in many places, what do you see out there? Maize field, as far as you can see, on one side, and the other is probably soybeans, and then you go in another part of the world, and as far as you can see, there is palm oil plantations. That can't work. We just heard it. It cannot work. So I think this is what we need to change. Uh, and so biodiversity loss, so I don't have to go too much in it, because it, that's a big, big issue. And the agriculture we are having now is actually part of the problem. It's actually a big part of the climate change problem, when it could be actually the biggest part also of the uh, solution. As we, we know, we heard it many times uh, since the Paris COP21, the Quatre pour Mille initiative, which was launched there. We're still waiting to see something really happening somewhere. But the, the, the ideas are there. The political commitment is not there. This is what's missing. And there won't be political commitment until you and myself and everybody else out there start to put pressure on the people in charge. And this is what you mentioned is the governance. Good governance is actually listening to the people, not to, uh, to everybody, not only to one side like the private sector. And then again, I think we, we, it's not only environmental issues, we have the social issues, poverty, disempowerment, uh, marginalization uh, of women, the youth. So we have all these problems, and all these need to address together, not one over here, something over here, or something over there, because that's exactly what's being done. We have done a lot of work. The integration to actually people can see you know, the change uh, happening when it needs to happen. So just a few images, okay, we have malnutrition. I want to insist here on this one just briefly because we need to understand that actually we produce enough food for the 10 billion people already. So when FAO says we need more food, I tell them that's not true. We need to waste less, we need to produce different type of foods, we need to produce better food, better nutrition. We don't need more calories. We have more than enough, even for 10 billion. We don't have enough nutrients in, those, in that food. That's why we have to stop with this maize craze on a global scale, the soybean craze, and the palm oil craze. This is what's destroying us, the planet, the people, the economies. So, so, so when we, because, you know, we can say, all right, this is 4,000, uh, six, uh, 300 calories, I think about, yeah? Produced per year, no, per day per person. We need only half of that to be healthy. So nobody should tell me that we need more. We need different, in different places, produced by different people. This is what, what we need to do. So this is where I think we can make a huge change. And we need to stop with these food losses, food waste, and that's linked to a point I'll make later, cheap food. If what you put in the garbage can would cost a lot of money, you wouldn't do that, right? 
But now you always go out there and think, oh, cheap food, all right, I can buy a big package, put in the fridge, and after five days, half of it is green. And you don't even compost it, it goes into the uh, pile somewhere, produce methane, and make add to the climate change. So this is what type of problems we have. And so this agriculture here, I can tell you, that cloud is coming fast for many, many. And we can't allow that to happen. We need to change, we need to go back to a totally different agriculture landscapes, actually like I see around here, you know, much more uh, human, uh, human uh, size. But again, even when you're small, you can do it, you can do it wrong too. So it's, um, I think we have to really think about it. So we have disconnects out there in this agri-food system between agriculture and the environment, because big tissue, people want to produce or get more cheap food, so we make larger fields, more mechanizations, not thinking about the negative impact. Huh? We just look at the short-term benefit. Yes, we can produce cheap maize, rice, everything in very large scale. Uh, what are the costs? So there's a disconnect in the understanding between the agriculture production and the environment, between producers and consumers. Consumers wouldn't always, always pick the cheapest food in the market if they understood what the consequences are, not for themselves only, for their children in particular. Because now we're taking generation time. Because the sins of our fathers and grandfathers are what created the problem we have now. All right? We are trying to, f I mean, my generation, yeah, I'm part of that uh, problem, who, <laughs> people who have done a lot of bad things, or at least my generation, maybe not personally, I hope Dory to fix this thing for a long time, but it's, when you have only few people against a, a lot of people, it's difficult. And then the policies and expectation. You know, people make policies and they expect something good coming out, and they have just no idea, because they don't play out the scenarios which we could actually play out very well if we wanted to. So again, so these disconnects we need to remove, we need to change, cannot go on. And uh, Johan Rockström, way back in 2011, already published this, uh, uh, Planetary Boundaries. We have already gone way beyond. We heard it, biodiversity, 75% is lost, it's gone. Biotech cannot rebuild that. Some people think, oh, Hans, don't worry with your discussion with your biodiversity, we're just gonna make it. And now don't worry, because we have CRISPR-Cas, so we do even more and faster. And don't worry, everything is fine, everything is perfect. It's not, because when we lose certain things, they're lost, they're, they're burned, they're gone. Uh, you, you can look at the whole um, uh, issue of uh, nitrogen fertilizer and, and how much damage that has done already. Some things we can't even recover anymore. Uh, so I think, you know, when we see this, this, that we go so far out in the red on many issues, we should remain in here, then you can see the size of the, of the problem we're trying to address. So what happened? Now, we have heard quite a bit about ecosystem services. They are here. There are people in this system. We are recycling uh, nutrients. We have water uh, cycling in the ground. We have pest management, pollination. That's just sort of, these are these ecosystem services, in brief. So what happened? And actually, the agriculture, when we do it like this, we have this green agriculture, diverse, where a lot of CO2 is taken to the ground, and we have a happy consumer up there, what happens to him or her. And um, so what did we do? What did the world do? Because with ecosystem services, you don't make money. Nobody is selling them to you, right? So actually nobody is cashing money for them, except the farmers who actually would save money if they would actually do it. No, people out there decided, oh, we can replace the pest management from the nature uh, with chemicals. All right, then I can make money. I produce chemicals, I can sell them, all right. We produce GMOs because then everything is easy, right? Don't worry, we can produce plenty of food, we just use GMOs. Um, water, water cycling and nutrient cycling, don't worry, we do irrigation, we put all the fertilizer into irrigation, you know, everything is easy. That's what happened. So a few people got very rich, and the majority got poor and sick. And the guy over here has, has turned over also. And it, at the same time, we developed an agriculture which contributes half of the and food system, half of the, the greenhouse gases. I mean, that cannot go on, right? 
mostly when we have the research results, we get plenty. It's not that we have to go do more research. Sure, we need more research. Because today, less than 1% of the total ag research on a global scale goes into anything like agroecology. And then we have, I've been even very generous in what I can consider in there. Less than 1%. Now you tell me if with 99% of the total ag research, we can make the transition. Not possible. Because it's research and extension, it goes together. So, so again, so we need to press our policymakers, and I'm very sorry that Mr. Xian, Xian or whatever his name is, uh, the minister, is not here. I would tell him, right, you need to change where you put your money. Yeah, I said that before. When people are there on the front row, I don't mind. I have nothing to lose. I could retire tomorrow if I want to. But I'm still around because, this, because of this. And so what we need to do, we, we are thinking linear, OK? We need to think circular. It's nothing new. Nothing new. Are we doing it? No. Our researchers, our scientists thinking the system? No, they all have little boxes because they need to get a little grant from somewhere, and the people who give grants give grants for something defined, not for something a bit complex. So, so, so these are the issues we're dealing with. Now we say we need to integrate. So the three dimensions, they're not pillars, they are dimensions of system development are number one, the environment. Okay, when you start to look at. And then you add on it the society, the social part. And only at the end that you add the economy, and not the other way around. We do exactly the, the other way around, when even we go beyond the economy. And then, all around here, obviously, we have governance. And I will say now, good governance. So looking at agroecology, don't have to go into many details. I think you guys all know what I'm talking about here. But I think that what are the expectations now for, from agroecology? First of all, I think I need to point to the fact that agroecology is evolving. It's an evolving concept. Uh, the latest definitions in um, um, Stephen Glissman's book really make the point that it is also the food system. So it's really holistic this time around. So if you look, take the latest version of his book, you really get the, 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 the gist of what actually we're talking about when we talk agroecology. And under there, we can put in organic agriculture, biodynamic, permaculture, regenerative agriculture. Everything actually fits in there. Of, I mean, everything. Everything we know we should be fitting there, right? The only one thing that doesn't fit in there is green evolution type agriculture, uh, for example. And uh, FAO, even FAO, thanks to a few rebels inside, has come up with the 10 principles for agroecology. Um, and so the, the, the FAO also has finally organized a symposium and then another symposium, a global scale, a few symposia around the world. But it's slow. It's very slow. And I think that most government actually are not even present there at this discussion. Um, and are not really doing what needs to be done. And I will tell you why things are actually not happening. We can look at organic uh, agriculture 3.0. Well, we are right on there, right in the right direction. So we can see all these concepts are evolving into the right direction, in the right direction of being more holistic, of being inclusive of the uh, uh, three um, uh, dimensions of sustainable uh, development. So that's all uh, good. So if you look at some of the latest publication, all right, if you look at a few details, um, high diversity you have in, in, in the field, then also you already have a higher diversity in your plate. And higher diversity uh, also means less impact, less negative impact. And um, I'm going a bit fast, so I'll make sure that I have enough time maybe for a few questions at the end. Uh, the presentation will be available actually on, on, the, on the website of the conference. But Important, and that's where you, myself, uh, can do something. We have to change our eating habit. The trend on a global scale of what we consume and our diets are actually the problem and will remain the problem as long as we are here. This is how much you eat meat, dairy, um, I've got more meat here, even chicken or fish. And then look at the green part down here, being very small. Maybe not here in Taiwan or in some places where, as far as I can see, I was out yesterday for dinner. 
I only had green stuff. Okay, that was good. I'm still here, so you don't die when you eat green, right? Um, but even Barilla, this is a, a pasta company in Italy who is really doing very good research on, on diet changes, has come back now with this pyramid here. So this is where we need to go. Less here and more down here. And I think that's the key. That's the key. Because farmers will not produce something you don't eat or buy. So don't accuse the farmer. Look at yourself. What are you buying? And how much are you buying? So I think that's where, where they don't like. And so, but again, do we have enough diversity left out there? We lost a lot already. And you can see over the last 100 years what we used to have in terms of variety of different vegetables and what's left today. Although we are still plenty of tomatoes out there, but you know, we, we're losing them. And it, much faster now that you know, with the GM technology of all sorts, I uh, just read that they're now they're making new crispus gas uh, tomatoes, which uh, are supposed to be sweeter, for example. Yeah? Do we want sweet tomatoes? I'm not sure. Well, maybe somebody thinks so. And we know that if we go from conventional agriculture to regenerative and ecological agriculture, you know, we do much better in, in, in most indicators for sustainability, for health, environmental health, for example. So, so again, this is nothing new. I mean, 2016, yeah, all right, but the results behind this are already there for years. Uh, are we actually looking at them and, and we use the, putting them to, to work? Now, I also happen to be a member of the IPES iPhone food uh, panel of experts, food systems, and we published a paper uh, two years ago, uh, IPES 2016, from uniformity to diversity. And I'm sure some people have read it and seen it. If not, go get it. Because we make the point here 10 years after, uh, or that was eight years after the publication of the IASTD report, you know, that we need to transform, that we need to go over here to agroecological farming practices being it if you are in the industrial, but also in the subsistence. Because subsistence farming is not the future. It is not necessarily actually good. You know? I think we have a lot of good science to back up organic agriculture, for example, in agroecology, to make it better. We need to use the science. If we go out there and say, no, what our grandfather was to do is good, then we're going to be attacked. Say, yeah, but you cannot produce enough. People go hungry. Say, no, we have good science in organic agriculture and agroecology. A lot of very good science. But again, we know we have to, to cite it and make sure that people understand it's there to back up our, our, what, what we're saying. So if we were to change from this type of diet, which gets this black agriculture, uh, and go there, then we go back. And when we do that, we also become much more environmentally friendly and also more climate resilient. Now, the scaremongers out there, and there were papers come out just recently, the last few weeks, a number of papers come out and they say that organic cannot feed the world. Okay, number one, nobody's feeding anybody. Okay? Because we feed animals and people nourish themselves community nourish themselves, so we need to change the vocabulary, number one. And in America, when I go, I tell us to, to people where I am, I said, you don't have any responsibility to feed anybody, because you know, Americans say, we feed the world. European, no, we need to help Africa with food. All totally wrong. It's because of this behavior, of this overproduction on one side of the world, cheap, mechanized, huge amount of negative externalities that we actually kill the farming in Africa, in Latin America, also in Asia. The Americans can grow rice probably less than half the price than you do here. But that's not full accounting, right, as we know. So just to say, so, so now the people come out and say, yeah, but you with your organic stuff, you're never gonna feed the world. Feed, okay? Actually, we can nourish, we can nourish everybody because the convention, if you look at conventional to be 100, let's say in terms of production, organic in developing countries, basically in all emerging uh, societies, we go to 180, because we don't start at this corrupted agriculture. 
this industry. And so if you look at in industrial, all right, we may lose a little bit, maybe at the very beginning. It has been shown that in most places, after a few years, you do catch up. And in particular, if you change your measure of success. The measure of success is not how many tons per hectare we produce, or, or, but how much nutrients. Like Vandana Shiva says, no, how much health per acre, not how much kilograms. It doesn't mean anything. Starch, then you have obesity, diabetes, all right? So again, so, so we know much better. And actually, when you look at low external input versus high external input, I'll just look at these two, the red and the green one here. So um, we modeled this for Mozambique. Because the industry and Rockefeller and uh, World Bank have been putting huge amount of money in large-scale agriculture, industrial agriculture. And they said, we're going to produce a lot more food. Actually, in the short term, they may. And soon, your low level input, uh, low uh, external input agriculture is much better. So you'd be resilient. We can show that. We can do models. So if you use the principles of agroecology, organic agriculture, when in your models, you can show that in the short term, you, you are as good. In the longer term, you are better. And that takes, that's only yield here. We don't even look at nutrient contents and, and what, all what's around it, what's coming around it. So, so again, I think it's important. And we know so many things, SRI, you know that also. Although yesterday I didn't see any uh, on my trip down south. But when you do SRI, you, you, you beat the best eerie varieties. They don't like it down there in the Philippines when you tell them. But that's the fact. It's there. Cambodia is doing plenty of it, in Vietnam, in other places. Uh, so just to say, so we have a lot of good technologies where we can actually do uh, what we need to do. Oops, that's the wrong one. And I have to show this one because that's what the Kassawa Milliburg. So this wasp here, Epidurum carcis lopezi, which is about two millimeters big, saved 20 million lives. And we, we demonstrated that with biological control, you can control pests if you do it right. But you have to focus, you have to put your energy in one thing. And so we did not only this one, we did many, many more. It works, so wh what are we waiting for? Those institutes of the CGIR where I did this, uh, IITA in Nigeria, they have today basically zero biocontrol. It's all biotech. They are releasing GMO cassava now. Just as an example, GMO cowpeas. These are the people which actually I, I, I helped develop a whole biocontrol center for Africa, which has since gone uh, bust, uh, clear, because you have to have fighters there or not, if not, nothing happens. But just to say that even good examples are no match against some of the powers I'll talk about. Pollination, important, right? We know that. So are we paying attention? Yeah, a little bit. I just read this morning, the latest news, probably you've seen also, um, you know, they're replacing the neocotinoids with some new chemicals, which are actually just as bad. Because we don't need those chemicals to begin with. It's not we replace one with another and another, because it's always going to be the same thing again. No, we have to arrange the, 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 the system so we don't have the problem. Every pesticide you use, every fertilizer you're going to use, is actually a treatment for the symptom of your bad agronomy. Voilà. So we want to treat the cause. Why do we have a pest problem in our field, for example? And how can we change the way we do things to avoid the, those problems? We need to get more trees in our environment. Again, many places have a lot of trees. Others have gotten rid of all of them. So again, I think there are many ways we can do things better. We need to do, uh, and we can do larger scale too. It's not only, you know, sustainable agriculture. It doesn't have to be only the tiny fields. And we have to be careful with this also, but if we just say, oh, that's only small scale farming, we will go nowhere. And I think many farmers in the US have shown that they can actually get rid of fertilizer and their herbicides and GMOs if they do cover crops. And uh, we have a good friend here, Andre Loy here, he's done it himself, he's also a farmer. He knows that with cover crops you can actually do things, you don't need herbicides, right? But so, so that's there. And again, you know, we, need, we also can use mechanization. If we don't mechanize small, medium, and large, 
not extra large, young people will not stay in agriculture. You won't have people in 20 years going out with a hoe working in the field anymore. And we can mechanize, we can make life easier for people, important. And make sure that we have a system which is diverse, people, animals, and plants. That doesn't say that we cannot use also some levels of appropriate mechanization. I just saw a picture a few days ago from a program in Africa where the African Development Bank wants to spend, listen well, $24 billion in the next 10 years on the African continent, sub-Saharan Africa, uh, for transforming agriculture. So the example they were showing, and they already had a few there, mega tractors. Mega, okay, I mean, not the small tractor, the, the big thing. I mean, you know, th that's the problem. We have a problem at the policy level, at the people who have the money, they still have not understood, you know, that we can do things different. And so we have good examples of understanding. Good science is actually at the base of this uh, uh, example here of the push-pull. And uh, there's a little movie here which I don't want to play, but you can see it when on the, um, uh, on the, on the um, uh, website later. But here we have corn or maize, and here you have a, 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 a cover crop, desmodium, and here you have sort of a trap crop around, which is a, a grass, could be... Um, well, not any grass, but uh, Napier grass is a good one, and they're trying with some other grasses now who are very attractive. So what do they do? So these grasses attract the pest, either from when they come from outside the field or within the field, they'll go there, lay their eggs, and since the plant is not a good host, it attracts them. If it's no good host, they all die there. But the maize plants, we now figured out, the local variety, okay, the, the local, not the new hybrids, can react to the pest insect. When they get a pest insect on it, they'll give um, um, uh, pheromones out, or caramones as they're called, exactly, and will attract the beneficial insects. And we measure this now. 10 years ago, we couldn't. Now we can measure. A little thing like this, you can measure stuff out there in the field, right? Amazing. Local varieties, farmer selected varieties have the capacity to fend off insect attack, the same also with diseases, actually. And so once you have a system like this, it works for itself. And in addition, which is even nicer, uh, or very good too, so we have more carbon in the ground because there's a cover crop here which keeps the soil permanently covered. And it will also fight off the weeds because there's no space for weeds, in particular striga weeds. Um, and then uh, even, even better, we also get an, uh, nitrogen because the legume, which is the cover crop, actually fertilizes the crop. So you have corn, which is like more than two meters tall, with zero and fertilizer. Again, you know, this is not new. This has been going on for 20 years. We have try been trying this. Is it being promoted by the large, even NGOs, like Gates? No, it's fought. They're trying to fight it wherever they can. Uh, and the governments, no, they're fighting it because they want the money for importing more seeds, fertilizer, pesticides. So this is where we are. So we have good so methods. And here, if you start to integrate all this, um, what happens? We create synergies, okay? The income of these farmers gets bigger. It's more than the sum of the elements because you integrate. The synergies in that system are enormous. I mean, this is not small uh, beans here we're talking about, right? It's possible. That's where we need to go, integration. Uh, of, of the different uh, factors. And you see here we have push-pull, that's what you saw you, but there's beekeeping in there, malaria control, very important, set safe fly control because people need animal attraction. So once you solve all these little problems, you actually really make the, the, the train move. Right? Things are moving then in the right direction. So it's possible we can do it. And uh, also what's important, the soil, we heard it, we, but we don't pay enough attention to soil biology. Millions of publications out there on soil uh, physics and fertilizer use. Has anyone looked into the life that's going on on the ground? It's much more than above. How many times more? Well, I don't even know. But a thousand probably or even more. So if you don't pay attention to what's going on under our feet, we cannot do anything. Because healthy soil, healthy plant, healthy people, healthy planet, right? 
but it starts with the soil. So, so, so we have to, to really rethink a lot of what we do in terms of agriculture. And uh, many papers came out, you've seen in the background, can dirt save the earth? <laughs> I don't like the term dirt, it's just like feeding soil. But um, yes, it can. And I think that it, if we don't pay attention to soil, we'll all fry, because the soil is the solution to the climate change. And we know that this type of agriculture here, and I know my, my friend Andre Roy has got the numbers, could actually absorb not only um, um, all the emissions done, but even one and a half times. So we can reduce the amount of CO2 which is out there, because even if we stop producing CO2 today, down to zero, we're still gonna go past the two degrees Celsius we should have. So we need to get these things in the negative. And the only way to do this is actually to really apply the, the, the concepts uh, behind agroecology and in particular now the regenerative uh, agriculture, which again, we want to regenerate. We want to be better year after year. So, all right, we know all this stuff. We have more and more evidence. Although we know, you know your evidence you have, people say, ah, no, no, it's not good. You know, we got better one, right? Monsanto always has the better evidence than you until now, but just wait, it's not, <laughs> not, not much longer. Um, so what's, what can we do? The whole issue behind this is what we call the political economy of food system, or we call the lock-ins. And this is this paper from IPES I mentioned before, is a very important uh, component. So here we have concentration of power. It's huge. It's controlling everything under your nose. And so what in agriculture, we found a number of things. Export orientation. There's hardly a country I went to, they don't say, I want to be the biggest exporter of food. Never mind what happens home, we want to export. India, Prime Minister Modi told me in a meeting about a year ago, we went to see him. Oh, you know, agroecology, I know it's good. We need to do more of it, that, that's fine. I know, tell me how. At the same time, then he says, but you know, India has to become the major food exporter. Oh, then we didn't say anything because we didn't want to annoy him right there. But, you know, what about nourishing your people first and well? Nobody needs American food. Nobody needs Indian food out there, right? Maybe Singapore, but that's a small amount. And so this, this fixation with export orientation, the expectation of cheap food, all of us, that's killing. That's, so we, when we do that, we're just helping the people who have a lot of power. Feed the world narrative, exactly. Ah, oh, everyone wants to feed the world. We need to go away from these type of things. Compartmentalized thinking. No, pigeonhole, small thing, small thinking, short-term thinking. We need to get rid of this. Uh, short-term thinking, yeah, that's sort of connected. You know, how can I make more money today? Tomorrow, who cares, because I won't be around, so maybe somebody else's problem. Yeah, it's not. We all have children, or the most of us, and we have also young people here, I think we have a responsibility toward the new generation, so we gotta change things. The measure of success, exactly, kilogram per hectare versus uh, um, um, health per hectare, for example. You know, you just said more, more uh, ill is not really a measure of success, or more money in the end. And we have a path dependency, green revolution. That thing is not yet dead. Because there's a green revolution 2.0, 3.0, and now it's actually called climate smart agriculture. That's now the, the new um, impersonation in some ways of green evolution. It's a reductionist approach to what we call agroecology. They're picking a few elements and say, okay, don't worry, we don't need the whole thing, we're just gonna do two or three things and we're good just like in the past, just like what they did with IPM, Integrated Pest Management, basically gutted the whole concept. And if you go to that report, you'll find um, more details also on you know, what can we do, actually, to change all these uh, different things. So again, you, I'll leave it up to you to, to read. Can we do it? We have simulated uh, in a model up from uh, 2010 uh, to 2050, sorry, the very bad, the thing so bad, you cannot believe it. On my computer, it's very sharp. Uh, so there's something with the setting. 
But you know, business as usual, the baseline is about 2,000 calories per person. If we apply green agriculture, agroecology, we go to 2,500 calories per day per person by 2050, using less land, less water, um, so, as, as an example, so about, this is about 2,500. And if we go continue business as usual, you know, mean more fertilizer, more pesticides, we actually grow less. And never mind all the negative impact this will have. But on the positive side also, you can see that if we do that uh, by 2030 or 2050, we improve, you know, we reduce poverty, minus 26%. Or nutrition is better. Or for example, the footprint uh, is better. As you know, that we're already uh, eating uh, right now, I think we just reached the threshold of our uh, footprint, ecological footprint. I think uh, these few days, uh, we have eaten, consumed the interest of the world's natural capital. So like your bank account, from now on, you're eating the capital. The interest is already gone. How long can you do that? How long can we continue to do that? And I think this is what we need to change. And we have this framework, uh, the um, SDG. So when you go back to Rio 92, uh, Agenda 21, I'm sure some of you re remember. You, you probably have even been there. Uh, and then we went to the Millennium Development Goals. That was all for developing countries only. But now we have something which is really for everybody out there, uh, the SDGs. Again, it's not perfect. But it, it embodies a lot of the language we have defined in the IAA STD report. Many NGOs, 150 we got together before Rio plus 20. We went to Rio plus 20. We made a lot of noise there. And we managed to get our small paragraphs into the final document. It took a lot of work for many people, but I can tell you it was NGOs and a few friendly government. Because we all uh, have some connection in our own government, so we managed to get them uh, to pay attention to something, so that's where we are. Not perfect, but it's the best we can do. And you can see that agriculture is very central. See so if you can go to connects to everything else, and you can take actually any one of them, you will see that they will connect to everything. So here, again, integrated and, and uh, system thinking is where on what's going to help us. Because we won't get to these uh, targets if we don't create synergies. It means that we make more out of the money we have. And we have to stop thinking that, you know, every one of these things is a ministry and they're going to do their own little work. So, oh, don't bother me. I'm a health minister. I know what's good for the people. No. They need to talk to agriculture. They need to talk to environment. Because these are very strong connections. And so we need to link all these things. And that's what we are about to do already. There's a number of people out there working with models uh, and a, a, a group of people to, to make uh, that change. But again, we need to address the trades off which exist. We need to break the silos, which are very strong out there. So we need to uh, use the synergies. And also, we need to get together and have a shared view of that future. You can't do this alone. We may have a good science somewhere, a good scientist, but if they don't talk to the people out there, they're not doing anything. So how can we bring the people together to actually discuss? And so we have four hours, international level, at the CFS, for example. And uh, so using, again, these uh, SDGs, we also need to talk at national level and sub-national level, at the community level, bring people together. Tell them, OK, what are the issues? How can you contribute your piece to achieving SDGs. It's not the government that's going to do it. It's the people. So we need to break this thing down all the way to the people in, in, by inventing ways and a way of doing it. And so we at the Minimum Institute actually have figured a way where we have this multi-stakeholder uh, discussion. We do fancy system dynamics models with them. They build it with us. They customize to the country, play the scenarios. Do you like it? You don't like it? What policy is needed to get this happen? And then you go around and, and you discuss. Then you have everybody on board. So it doesn't come from the government down, or it's not only a few things, people involved at the community level who do something. Everybody is really part of the system, 
and basically we uh, reconnect uh, all the different uh, pieces. So again, that's the important is to uh, connect. Conclusion, so what do we have there? Um, all right, we want to promote a sustainable and biodiverse agriculture, right? But also the food system, which goes with it, because the food system also it has to be diverse. We don't want only McDonald's around, right? Or the Kentucky Czech frit and, uh, fried chicken. So, so, so again, the, the, there's a cultural diversity which has to be taken into account in your agriculture and food system. You can't do without. Actually, we see where this leads already. Um, and again, we need to help also the small farm, family farms, they can be any size, to adapt uh, to, to this whole issue of climate change. And because they're the first one affected, but they're the first one who can do something about it. But that is not happening without support. They need help for that. There's a cost to the transformation. The land issues is always there, always going to be there, I think. It's a very difficult topic to tackle in any situation. But I think if we don't, we don't go anywhere. Uh, my own country, in Switzerland, you know, we are building over the best land, and the farmers have to go up into the mountain. I mean, it's what a nonsense, right? Put the buildings up into the mountain. In California, where I live, at the moment, same thing. The best land, even by University of California, Davis, the, the, the best land is now built over in two-story buildings when you could make, a, a, I don't know, a hundred-story tall building if you wanted to. You see, this is, where are the policies here? And why is nobody going down the street and demonstrating? Even those students, nobody says anything. I can't believe it. This is, so, so again, we need to look at our land. How do we use it? Um, can help the women farmer? And I think the key lever, and that's probably my last big point, is true costing. Until you pay the true cost of what you buy. If it's a microphone here, thing here, your food, we won't go anywhere. We cannot continue to externalize the costs to society and the benefits to a few companies. Exactly what's happening right now. The world is getting, the 0.1% one, the getting so much richer, and all the rest is getting poorer. And that's exactly why. So true costing, and that's going to be difficult to implement because you're going to really get uh, to, to, to stir up uh, an, an anthill here, right? But if we don't do that, I don't see how we can make this transformation. And I think that's really uh, uh, what we're going to have. And that's every one of us can do that, can take the lead in uh, making those changes uh, because the decision at the end is when you shop. Shop for whatever you shop. Do you pay the true price? Yes or not. And I have said, uh, you mentioned TIB. The, the latest TIB report is actually trying to go, get at this. Um, and I think it's coming. But we are at the report stage. Now let's see if we can go to the action stage. Thank you very much for listening. Shishek.